This is Phil Barassa, and you're listening to Whelm, the Young Justice Files. Hello, team. Welcome back to Whelmed Reprints. It's the holiday season here in the States, so we'll be taking time to spend with our families and to get ready for Season 3, premiering on January 4th, 2019. With Whelmed Reprints, our team will be picking a few of our favorite episodes to bring to new listeners. Our third reprint happens to coincide with this week's release of Misplaced in the enhanced episodes on DC Universe, in which you'll hear me reference this specific two-parter. Chris Newton is the co-creator and host of the Gameable Saturday Morning Podcast. Growing up, Saturday mornings were the highlight of my week. I'd get up at 6.30 and ride out the mornings eating cereal and surfing between stations until almost noon. Of course, I also started playing role-playing games like Dungeons & Dragons and the superhero RPG Champions in my pre- and early teen years. When I heard there was a podcast that did Whelm-style storytelling analysis on scores of my favorite shows and discussed adapting them to RPGs, I downloaded it immediately. Then we got the announcement about Season 3, so Chris and I started talking about gameable Whelmed crossovers. Chris first came on the show to talk about gaming, but after that first interview, we talked for at least an hour off mic, and I knew I had to have him back. Even knowing how insightful and brilliant Chris was, I didn't expect this episode to be much more than a fun romp into Captain Marvel, a.k.a. Shazam. I was so wrong. Chris took me on a psychological, mythological, spiritual, social, mystical journey into the world of Billy Batson. Chris gave me so much information on so many topics that I'm compelled to listen to these episodes again and again to catch the things I missed the first time and the tenth time around. If you're as fascinated by Captain Marvel's role in Young Justice as we are, just wait until you hear Chris talk about the influence this foundational character had and still has on the comic industry. And of course, if you have access to the enhanced episodes, check out Misplaced, which aired this week. You can hear Neil blow both our minds about something in the fight scene neither Emily nor I had picked up on and watch me cry on camera to the ending. Glad that's recorded for posterity. (laughs) We hope you enjoy today's double-length collection and your upcoming holiday season. Stay wound, everyone. Recognized, Uncle Walker, D-0-1. Recognized, Gameable Saturday Morning, D-2-0. Hello, team. Today in the cave, we have a first, in that we have our first returning discussion guest. Chris Newton, along with his wife Katrina, hosts the Gameable Saturday Morning podcast. We recently had Chris on the show to talk about role-playing games, the history of Saturday morning cartoons, and more. So much more, actually, that we invited Chris back on the show to talk on mic about some of the many things we ended up talking about off mic. Chris, thanks so much for coming back on the show. Thank you for having me back. It was, it was a great time last time. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that our discussion sessions draw on anything and everything related to Young Justice, including both seasons of the series so far, the comics and the video game. If you have not seen, read, or played all of the material and are spoiler wary, please consider this your warning. And with all that out of the way, let's dive in. This is odd. We were talking about this off mic, but uh, all my intro episode uh, questions, most of them were all answered. But let's let's touch a little bit for those people who might not have heard the other things that you talked about in the previous discussion. Can you just talk briefly about uh, Gameable Saturday Morning and kind of the thing that you do that they can go check out? Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll give the quick version. It's a podcast called the Gameable Podcast that has been through many iterations. We started out talking about Disney movies, then we did all the Pixar movies, and now we're talking about Saturday morning cartoons. All of the episodes are about sort of first reviewing the animated material, whether it's a film or a series or whatever, and then we get into some tabletop role-playing discussion where we talk about adapting the characters, the setting, the plot structure of that material into a role-playing game. And then we do some other miscellaneous things on the podcast as well. We have a little uh, side project called The Sceptered Isles where we talk about Shakespeare in much the same way. And of course, we talk about professional wrestling. Whatever else we're talking about, we add on that little <laughs> that little sprinkle of pro wrestling. So yeah, that's what we do. And then I've got another podcast called Mega Dumbcast, which is another step removed from what you guys do here. It has nothing to do with animation. It's just me talking about one particular role-playing game, Ninjas and Super Spies. I do a daily podcast where I talk about the dumbest thing on every page of that stupid book, (laughs) which I love. (laughs) 
the stupid book that you love yes. and adore. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's how that's how this happens. <laughs> this is the thing about uh, this is the thing about being a fan, right? Mm-hmm. You can be a fan and you can adore something and still, you know, be aware of and and acknowledge its flaws and talk about how other things could be better. That's not going to change how much you love the thing. Yeah, exactly. Ninjas and Super Spies is it's like it's my dad. It's like I love you so much. Here's everything that's wrong with you. <laughs> Interesting analogy. Perhaps uh, when we get the the Arkham Sessions psychologist on the show, we could have you on and we could discuss that <laughs> a little bit deeper and go from there. But but let's uh, let's move to what our topic was because it was interesting that after we started after we stopped recording last time, we started talking about Captain Marvel, aka Shazam, and you were incredibly excited about potentially coming back and talking about this. A uh, character who's nearly as old as Superman mm-hmm. s- and has had so much media wrapped around him over the years, yet is somehow still an enigma to a lot of people. Can you talk a little bit about the history of the character of who Captain Marvel is or a Shazam now that his name has been changed? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I, first of all, I want to just as a disclaimer, and you and I talked about this, but I'm not like a Captain Marvel scholar. I know that they exist. I I listen to their podcasts. I am not one of them. But I just really like the character, and I know a lot. By the by, I've learned some things about his history, which is all kind of common knowledge. So just to give like the basic recap of where he's from, because I think a lot of people, you're right, don't really know that there's so much history there. Captain Marvel is originally a Golden Age character. He was uh, from a separate company, not originally a DC character, originally from a comic series called Wiz Comics by Fawcett Comics. He came around in like 1940. So Captain Marvel, basically the, the the central conceit of it is it's a kid, Billy Batson. He has this encounter with this ancient wizard Shazam who gives him the ability to say the magic word Shazam, which gives him the powers of these various uh, gods and mythological figures and folklore heroes or whatever. He then goes and has adventures being able to transform from his kid form as Billy Batson, who is sort of like this um, plucky kid into Captain Marvel, who is a grown-up superhero, and back. He says his magic word, lightning strikes him, he gets his powers. So that sold really well. That superhero story did really well for itself in the market, competing against Superman and and famously outselling Superman for quite a long time. But sales did eventually begin to decline, and importantly, DC ended up coming after Fawcett about Captain Marvel, who they perceived to be, or, or claimed to perceive, as a copyright infringing um, uh, property, uh, because he's too similar to Superman. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm laughing because I'm finding probably what you're going to talk about in a minute very ironic. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm going after. <laughs> Continue. So basically, yeah, there's like uh, this. There's this complicated ca- court case that goes on about you know whether Captain Marvel is too similar to Superman and like whether the copyright to all Superman's material has been appropriately set up. What it boils down to is the character is becoming less profitable by the moment for Fawcett. They don't want to continue this legal battle. And so they settle with uh, DC. And so they're not going to produce the Captain Marvel comics anymore. And then, of course, DC comes in and scoops him up later so that they can just buy the rights and, and have Captain Marvel as one of their own characters, who they, for some reason, once they had him, didn't feel was too close to Superman to to use. Right. <laughs> <laughs> The problem, of course, is that his name is Captain Marvel. And so DC then, they were they were cursed, basically. It's like, uh, you know, they shouldn't have taken the dwarven gold of Captain Marvel because now they're stuck with interminable legal battles with Marvel Comics. <laughs> yes. So they ended up in this weird thing where, like, he can be Captain Marvel, but he can't be Captain Marvel on the cover or, like, on the toys. You have to call him Shazam there because of, like, trademark issues. That's all boring legal stuff. The more interesting thing that happens with the character is that he gets kind of his own subcontinuity in DC Comics, uh, like pre-crisis kind of era. They kind of try to revive the character, and it didn't really go so well. He often was paired against Superman as like some kind of sort of dream match because the two are perceived to be like equals and like different takes on the same basic idea, uh, which is maybe not really the case. But I think that the legal battles contributed to that perception. Then in Crisis on Infinite Earths, when all of the various DC, like different Earths, the numbered Earths were combined, 
Captain Marvel and his whole entourage got thrown into the mix with the main DC continuity, which is something that is pretty divisive among fans of the character. I think there are people who feel that Captain Marvel and his lore really need their own playground. And then there are others who feel that incorporating him and, and letting him like grow beyond his Golden Age portrayal and mix with the rest of the DC universe is essential to his success. Because it's always been this continuous question of how do you take this character who once was outselling Superman and bring him back to that kind of prominence and success. So in the 52 reboot, I don't know a ton about this, but the headline for Captain Marvel fans is they finally officially changed the character's name to Shazam to avoid confusion. And so I think a lot of old school fans are not happy with that change. We'll see if it sticks. You know, it's DC Comics. So it's like, you know, it's it, it, yeah, <laughs> it'll it'll always revert and it'll always change again. But what's interesting about Captain Marvel, as you alluded to, in terms of his uh, like media presence and his his cultural presence, is that like the the idea of the magic word Shazam, the the iconography of Captain Marvel are are fairly well known, and I think almost all count comic fans, even casual ones, have seen him around because he's you know been in the Justice League, he's you know featured in different media, often in sort of a second string role, but he's also had a ton of different portrayals that have kind of branched out in a very a very wide reaching way. There's a serial. There's like a um, like a classic movie serial about him. He's had a live action TV show. You know, he's had animated portrayals of various kinds and all kinds of different shows. Jeff Smith, famous for uh, Bone, the, the oh yeah, such a great series. Uh, he did uh, a sort of separate continuity little mini series about Captain Marvel that I really enjoy called uh, Shazam: Monster Society of Evil. And very interestingly, in British comics, they used to reprint Captain Marvel until the lawsuit that that prevented his publication by Fawcett. And so they basically replaced him with a virtual duplicate of the character called Marvel Man. Oh my gosh. No, really? I have never heard of this. This is amazing. Yeah, and it's actually really important to comics history because what happens is they do just like the thinnest kind of like cover over the fact that this is still Captain Marvel. And then, right, just and then, filing off the serial numbers and slapping him up on Yeah, the- <laughs> his magic word is Kimoda, which is atomic spelled backward. And <laughs> they continue to publish the adventures of Marvel Man in the UK, right? So now there are basically new Captain Marvel adventures in the UK, but not in America. Then the characters revived in 1982 by Alan Moore. And so he, there's a new... They end up having to have a new title for this as well because of the Marvel legal issues. So this is where we get Miracle Man, which is Moore's really like trend-setting series yeah. that tells this very like dark story within this sort of borrowed mythos of the Marvel family. Whoa. I, I Okay, so I'm, I'm very familiar with Miracle Man because I, I worked in several comic stores between the late 80s and early 90s, but it is not a comic that I ever picked up. And yeah. I didn't know anything about this. That that he was a reflection or a borrow of the that was pretty common in the late eighties and early nineties too because you also had um, basically Marvel wanting to do stories about DC ish characters so they have like Doctor Spectrum mm-hmm. as instead of Green Green Lantern and they have you know their parallels you know to to the DC comics and they and Marvel and DC have a long history of stealing i.e. Uh, homaging other. <laughs> You know, characters like Hawkeye was an homage to Green Arrow, except they were trying to kind of mock him a little bit, so they made him a criminal, you know. And and it, even in Young Justice, Black Spider is clearly evil Peter Parker. Like, there's no <laughs> way around. I mean, literally had Josh Keaton do the voice, you know, from, from the Spider-Man animated series, and, you know, there's no hiding it. But I, I do not accept that. I believe the Black Spider is a fully original character, just like uh, that guy in the Squadron Supreme, Skrullian Skymaster. Right. Squadron Supreme. God, that was a miniseries. They did a miniseries of that a few years ago where all the Squadron members got four-issued minis of their own, and it was really good. But anyway, it uh, it's interesting because it is the evolution of this unique aspect of comics. There are a lot of things as a media that as media that comics are unique for, and one of them is the fact that you have 70, 80 year old characters, and Superman acts and looks and, and does things very differently than when he was first created. Same with Batman in those, you know, the first year he was of Batman, he was even, you know, using sidearms and whatnot. 
Mm-hmm. But the characters can evolve and grow, and, and very rare, with a few exceptions, one being maybe Sherlock Holmes, you're not going to really run into novel characters or other media characters that get evolved and changed and, you know, have so many versions of them. It's it's very unique to comics, but but what you're talking about is a whole nother step. This isn't just like, oh, the modern Captain Marvel is a little different than the 1940s. You're talking about, no, he's he's been a, a, a kind of an imprint or concept or, you know, an ideology or something that's been stamped onto other characters who have then gone off to do their own things, which I think is fascinating. Yeah, and, and he in turn is is a recipient of that. I mean, one of the things that I think is, it's it's like a weird sort of comic book paradox where you've got, on the one hand, characters who, you're right, have tremendously long histories and have so many changes to them over time. And so you can always pick, you know, your favorite version of the character or your, you know, handful of like go-to versions of the character that you love and others that you don't care for. And as a writer or, or other artist, you can always change things up if you want to portray the character in a different light. And yet, there are these deep, iconic roots to the character that are like this creative wellspring. And I think that's why you can't hold Captain Marvel down, is because at the end of the day, he's a character who is fundamentally elusive. He has the wisdom of Solomon, not just wisdom. <laughs> he has the strength of Hercules. And so you have these characters that is, are so embedded in people's consciousness and people's upbringing and even their religion that then feed into this superhero. And, I mean, he's got one of the great origin stories ever. He's got that fundamental wish fulfillment of, like... Yeah. I mean, what could be a better comic book character? There's definitely fan service. Fan service going on there. Yeah. It's, it's uh, why why was Robin added to the Batman comics? Captain yeah. Marvel is literally an 8- or 10-year-old boy, you know, except in second season of Young Justice, where he's then suddenly 15 or whatever, which is really... <laughs> Which which made my head skip a li- little bit, I have to tell you. <laughs> like, anyway, please continue. It, yeah, the character is iconic and yet precarious in certain ways. And I think the aging up of Billy uh, or changing Billy's personality is an example of that. It's always hard to know when you're dealing with this character, okay, this is rock solid. Billy Batson, the, the boy who is like the eight-year-old boy who we hope is like the audience who's picking up comics for the first time. And he's like, oh, this is so cool. It's a character who is a boy like me, but then when he gets in trouble, he becomes a superhero um, who has all these amazing, like he's the best at everything, right? It's almost like I am my own big brother who comes to get me out of trouble. Right. (laughs) But then when you start to tell a story about this character, if Billy Batson ages or if someone starts to say, as has sometimes been done in the character's publication history, well, we can't really do like the scrappy orphan who lives on the street. Like that's a very different, maybe grimmer story nowadays than it, than it was at the time in the golden age when this was created. So we need to make Billy like streetwise or like, you know, we need, like that starts to interfere with that basic iconic appeal of the character. But you do need to tell stories. It can't just be a great origin. It, you have to have a, like a month to month story. So things do have to change. So there's there's a tension there between the the creative demands of the media. So I love Captain Marvel, but I can understand why. He's often been relegated to like background roles because he's a character you don't want to forget about. He's kind of a Hawkman in that regard. It's like, I love his look. I love what he is. But telling stories about him has become like kind of a storied pitfall for creators. And that's interesting because I think maybe this I think this reflects on some of the things that I talk about uh, having to do with Superman. And Mm -hmm. uh, about this idea that you can't tell good Superman stories because he's so powerful. Right. Yeah. Well, if you only look at the superpowers, Captain Marvel is basically Superman plus magic, right? Like, yeah. in a way, I'm way oversimplifying, and I'm sure the, the guys at Captain, the people at Captain Marvel talk will, will jump all over me for this. <laughs> but when you look at the best told Captain Marvel stories, in my opinion, they look at the uh, things that are not his superpowers, right? When mm-hmm. and when they do in its in its best incarnation do the Superman v Captain Marvel stories, they are kind of about the powers, but not that's not what makes it interesting, right? Yeah, it's not that. So, like in the Justice League Unlimited series, there one of my favorite episodes is called Clash, mm-hmm. and it's where Captain Marvel has finally uh, Superman was off planet doing something. He comes back and finds out this Captain Marvel character has been inducted into the Justice League. And he's even a bigger Boy Scout than he is. And Mm -hmm. he kind of has some issue. He isn't sure what's going on. But, I mean, even Batman 
<laughs> he says something like, "Like why do you why do you trust this guy so much?" And Batman's all, "We like him. He's Sonny, <laughs> or something like that." It's just hilarious. <laughs> But the actual conflict, they do end up fighting in this episode, but the conflict isn't about what the fight is. The conflict is about Lex Luthor wants to create a, a neighborhood that's, a, that's a, a city block where homeless people can live. He has, uh, has quote-unquote, stolen some kryptonite to use as the power source for an unlimited generator to power this neighborhood. But he has, but he quote unquote stole it. That's part of the, like the storyline. And the question is like, oh, why does Lex want kryptonite and blah blah blah? Mm-hmm. He invites Superman to the city, to this little city block, to uh, inaugurate this thing. Superman shows up, but he's very suspicious of Lex, and he looks around with his X-ray vision, and he sees this thing with kryptonite in it, and he thinks it's a bomb. Mm-hmm. Well, Captain Marvel's there because he's a little kid and he's an orphan, and this is this is a neighborhood that would affect him and the people that he knows. And so he's there and then finds out Superman is destroying things, trying to get to this quote-unquote bomb, and he wants to stop him because Billy is 10 years old and he believes that the goodness in Lex, which is a problem, I agree. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But what ends up happening is, you know, Lex just wanted to kind of, you know, tweak Superman's nose a bit or whatever, and it ends up that Captain Marvel and Superman destroy half of this philanthropic thing that he does. And in the very end, there's a... Captain Marvel quits the Justice League, but not after going into the boardroom and schooling Superman about not being superhero enough. Mm -hmm. That whole scene makes me want to cry. The way he's talking (laughs) about uh, being a 10-year-old and looking up to these heroes and then unfortunately getting a look behind the curtain and telling them he's never had to stoop to the level of the villains that he fights to, to beat them. That's what the story is about. The fight's great, don't get me wrong, but... The story is about that morality and what comes out intact at the end, at the end. Yeah, I mean, the appeal of Captain Marvel as that sort of symbol of innocence or or sort of pure heroism. I think that's something that because his 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 personal golden age was in the golden age of comics, that's something people often go back to. And also because he has this cast of characters surrounding him that I like he adventures with Captain Marvel Jr. and Mary Marvel. And, you know, he's got the Lieutenant Marvels and he's got all these kind of silly stories. He's got Mr. Takitani, of course, um, who Takitani. is an, That's an, right. an anthropomorphic tiger in um, in the original version. So it is sort of lighthearted and I think often serves as a counterpoint in stories to other heroes who are sort of darkened or or compromised by the stories that are told about them on a monthly basis. And again, that tends to push captain marvel into that side role of like being a foil for superman or whatever yeah you know it's interesting and on the flip side of that there was a there's a we've talked about it once on the show at some point i wish i could remember what issue it was but it was a superman comic i think and there's a big conflict there's a big fight some terrible things happen and captain marvel disappears takes off and superman follows him and finds him like sitting on the top of mount everest or something and so Superman walks up to Captain Marvel, and Captain Marvel's got tears going down his face, and he's like, Marvel, we got to get back to this fight. you got to come help me, that kind of thing. And Marvel's just bawling because he starts talking about this person, you know, Johnny died, and it was my fault. And he's like, are you talking about that little kid that died? And he's like, yeah, he was my best friend. <laughs> and mm-hmm. Superman is looking at this adult man going like, what are you talking about? This kid was your best friend. And then he changes back to Billy, and mm. that's the first time Superman realizes or finds out in this particular story arc that he is a 10-year-old. And there's like a beat pause. There's just a, there's just like a panel of no voice. And the next panel is Superman saying, who did this to you? Yeah. And then he, the next page is him, you know, facing down the wizard that turned this little, put the pressures of the world on this little boy. So it's the flip side of kind of clash where like Superman is seeing a potential darkness that could be creeping into Billy and is trying to protect him and mentor him. And like you can take the story from both sides and I love how even though their their powers are parallel in many ways again the powers are not irrelevant but they they need to be they need to feed into what the story is you're telling, you know? That's exactly it. I, this is a really good transition because uh, you know, as we were talking about putting this episode together, I know I, I was saying I really wanted to talk about the powers because I think that they also touch on like Young Justice stuff because that's one of the things that stuck out to me about that series is how it is deeply personal storytelling. 
but it does not right. squander the fact that we're talking about superpowered individuals, which sometimes happens. Sometimes you have a great story that happens to feature superheroes, but their superpowers don't matter. And that's fine if that's the story you want to tell, but it is a bit of a missed opportunity. It is not playing to the distinctive strengths of the genre, whereas we can take a character like um, Captain Marvel, and just to take one, one thing about his powers, the fact that he has this dual life as Captain Marvel and a child, that opens up storytelling potential that you can't you can't do a, like a kitchen sink drama about a boy who becomes a man when there's trouble in the same way. Like you right. can use it as a metaphor, right. but but you can't actually. It's sort of like um, you know the best sci-fi uses the, uh, its sci-fi premise to really engage its characters and its plot and do something interesting that couldn't be done without the speculative fiction aspect. Right. So the whole idea of like yeah, what happens when you invest a child with this kind of power and what exactly does that mean because in the older versions of captain marvel captain marvel is definitely an adult and billy is a child albeit like a particularly plucky and competent child and when he calls upon captain marvel he changes into a different person who i think arguably is coded as like adult billy slash billy's father I mean, you could right. get into some analysis here of like, is this Billy's super ego? Like, what's going on here exactly? But like, basically, he is he is definitely an adult when he's Captain Marvel, and he's fine. This is not something bad that was done to Billy. On the other hand, the version that we see in Young Justice is definitely a boy dressed up as a man to play superhero yeah. in certain ways. You know, the first time I've seen that interpretation or, or remember seeing that interpretation of him was in that Justice League Unlimited episode, mm. and it blew my mind. I was like, oh, oh my gosh, yes, yes, <laughs> that's the drama, that's the cool thing, right? That he's still a little boy, he's yeah. got that that joy, like the whole thing where he's he's got to leave after he saves Metropolis from some terrible threat, because he's got to get back to elementary school, <laughs> you know? It's almost like that, in a way, some of the story elements come from like the, the Janus playbook we've talked about in masks where it's that's that spider-man that yeah. that uh, stephanie brown batgirl that idea that he's trying to balance a real life like as a boy with being a superhero at the same time but all that's really turned up to 11 in him right it's really yeah. like important and significant particularly because he's an orphan right with the exception of his uncle dudley and we'll, we'll get into the family a little bit but actually just real quick though i i want to we've talked a little bit about his powers in, in vagueness and in parallel to Superman's, but I think it's kind of important to to dive into, like, what is the word Shazam? How does it break down? What are his powers? And then we can maybe dive into a little bit more of some of these other things we're talking about, just so people are up to speed. Yeah, let's let's enumerate those, because I think that his powers are are core to his appeal. And the best Captain Marvel stories engage the powers. You have all these different options, but you always got to go through, you know, the powers. So Shazam is an acrostic. It's not only the name of the wizard who gave him his powers, but it stands for the names of the various gods and heroes from whom he he gets his powers. So the first one is uh, S, which is for Solomon, the wisdom of Solomon. And I think maybe other than the power of Zeus, which comes later, the wisdom of Solomon is the hardest for writers to deal with it's the hardest to incorporate in stories but it's potentially one of the most interesting absolutely yeah i'm sorry i was i was nodding my head and it's podcast nobody can see me nodding, <laughs> agreeing with you i'm yes absolutely and, and you can see that like they nod to it in young justice because he has this sort of like homespun kind of innocent but good advice yes. and that's cool and i think it's maybe the best they could do in the context of his role in that show and their chosen take on the character it's very different when we take a Captain Marvel who's definitely an adult because then you're able to have a little bit like if if um this is a deep pull but there's an there's an old Marvel comic called Sleepwalker uh from the 90s. Oh my god. Yeah, okay. Do you yeah. know you know I Sleepwalker? To, no, I had to, I had to crack open a dusty file, but yeah, it's in there. <laughs> basically the conceit of it was it's uh this sort of like mind cop. Basically, it's like a guy who roams around in the astral plane, who's like a member of a race that right. guards people's minds. Anyway, he falls into one college student's mind. So he can manifest in the real world as a superhero, but only while his host is sleeping. So what you have is basically the secret identity is a college student who's like sleep deprived. And when he goes to sleep, a superhero comes out of his brain. And then if the host wakes up, then Sleepwalker vanishes. So they have to like, it's the 90s. So they have to leave each other messages on Rick's answering machine. Because they can never That's be awake great. at the same time, right? 
that's the old Captain Marvel Billy relationship is like, yeah, Billy gets in trouble and he needs Captain Marvel and a different, more competent person appears to handle the problem. And it's okay for him to have an amazing amount of wisdom because it contrasts with this brash, impetuous kid who tends to get in over his head. Just in the same way that, you know, Billy can get trapped under rubble and need Captain Marvel to lift him out. Billy can get into a situation where he's being duped. And then when Captain Marvel shows up with the wisdom of Solomon, he knows that he's being tricked and he can get out of it. If they're the same person, then you it's harder to tell that story. Okay, I want to I want to do a deep dive into the wisdom of Solomon. I have some strong opinions about the wisdom of Solomon yeah, go and how for it's it. handled. But that's it. Well, let's move into let's move into the other ones so people have some perspective and then let's go through them one at a time. Sure thing. The other one is the H is for Hercules. Uh, he has the strength of Hercules, pretty straightforward. I think maybe more important. It's more interesting than strength because it evokes Hercules. It invokes, you know, the wandering, the wandering monster fighter, sort of good natured, the guy who can just do anything with his amazing strength. He has the stamina of Atlas. I always get those confused because for me, Atlas, Atlas, the image of Atlas holding up the world on his shoulders invokes, uh, evokes strength, strength. Mm hmm where Hercules also evokes strength. So I never, I was like, why do they have, they're both the same, aren't they? But you, you're you saying that it's it's endurance? Yes. I think canonically, Captain Marvel doesn't need to breathe, eat, or sleep. And this is something that's often overlooked. Like, yes, Captain Marvel will lose in a race to the Flash. Yes, he will probably eventually go down in a straight up fist fight or you like, you know, bench press contest with Superman. But if it's a marathon, then Captain Marvel wins because Captain Marvel doesn't get tired. Interesting. I Cap- like that. Yeah, okay. Cap- Captain Marvel can fight forever if he wants to. He he's at peak efficiency always. Dude, I'm sorry. That's may sound ridiculous. That's a super cool distinction between himself and others. Yeah, it, and you can see the storytelling possibilities there because it's like, I mean, here's a guy who he's so eager to do the right thing. And unlike most of us, unlike even Superman, I mean, that's one of the great things that you can kind of do storytelling about Superman is that Superman has a lot of other responsibilities and he will eventually run out of energy. He will eventually get tired. He can't do everything, you know, much to his own distress sometimes. Captain Marvel is a guy who basically is summoned to solve a problem and do good in the world. You know, he is even if even if you believe he has the mind of Billy um, and that's your version of the story. This version of him with the wisdom of Solomon and the powers and the costume and everything is sort of brought into being. And his secret identity is kind of just an an orphan. I mean, he's really about doing good and he can do it indefinitely, which is kind of a um, kind of a burden in its own right. It lends this weird fairy tale aspect to the character. And so you can tell stories about, you know, him being called upon to do long-term things or like the story of Atlas and Hercules. I mean, if you needed somebody to hold up the earth, you know, Captain Marvel is someone you could call, and that's a story in its own right. You know. Yeah, I'm gonna. I, I got, I got, I got some stuff for that. All right, let's move on to the next ones. All right. Oh my God, my brain is spinning. I love it. So Z is the power of Zeus. This is the most nebulous of his powers. <laughs> different interpretations have seen it different ways. Some people will put his invulnerability down to the power of Zeus. Others will. He transforms by being struck with a lightning bolt. Some people will say the lightning and his various sort of subsidiary lightning type abilities come from Zeus. Um, yeah, that's, and then that's what I always thought. In some iterations of the character, he has magical ability where he can do like some spell casting or things like that. Oh, that's, really? That oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, often that's something he kind of needs to grow into. It's not part of the core Captain Marvel abilities. But uh, some people have sort of tried to retcon it into like, you know, he has all this other more advanced stuff. I love stuff. that. Because the idea implicitly is that Captain Marvel will kind of grow up to have all the Shazam powers. And Shazam is a wizard. Right, exactly. His own mentor is a wizard, which puts him in a different... You know, Emily Emily Buza, my, my co-host for the show, I think it was Emily, had said something about just this idea of... Um, like in season two of Young Justice, we were talking about where, where Billy goes from being... I think he's 10... And then, of course, five years later, he's 15. And she's like, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by the idea of Billy having, like, a crush on Zatanna. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, of course, you know, a lot of people have a crush on Zatanna. But it adds a layer to that, this idea that perhaps she can understand him or he can learn more about himself from the, the knowledge of magic that she has. Where I, I, for some reason, don't see him, like, turning to the warmth of Dr. Fate yeah. to help him with that, you know? Yeah, his his approach to magic is very um, 
very fairy tale, which there is a, an aspect of that to Zatanna. She's a cool character because she's she's in that like wizard mode of like you know she studies and that sort of thing but she also has like speaking backwards to do magical effects and like the stage magic right. affectation so she's sort of on that border between like the studious wizard type character versus the character who is like with this magic right. ring or with this magic wand i can do all these cool things she's kind of the i'm, I'm going to jump into D for a minute you know you, you cross a wizard with a bard you get a sorcerer right so she's yeah. the, the charis the charisma based spellcaster who's as much into showmanship as the intellectual study and the power of will and presence and personality as opposed to just Mm -hmm. the intellectual breakdown yeah yeah and you can see where that would appeal to billy because yeah his whole life is kind of defined by magic but it's not the studious kind of magic yeah interesting okay and so the next is you got your power of zeus uh after that you have traditionally the courage of achilles there have been versions of the characters that put the invincibility here. I, I, it's the first thing I think of. That's what would be, yeah, the invulnerability seems like. This depends on how you want to approach the character because it's all about what you want to do with storytelling with these powers. If it's important to you that Billy is the star of this comic and Billy has a superpowered form, you want the invincibility of Achilles because you're invoking the strongest sort of mythical archetype of that character. Right. right. He's a, he's like Achilles. No one can stop him on the battlefield. And you're preserving that when Captain Marvel succeeds in a story that's about being a good person and showing courage, that is Billy. Right. Uh, I see what you're saying. I personally that that's the story that appeals to me. But that's interesting that there are other interpretations. Huh? Yeah. Well, the other interpretation is we've got the escapist fantasy of being able to lift a mountain. Right. Uh, or hurl a car across the road. We've got the escapist fantasy of being able to fly. What about mm-hmm. the escapist fantasy of being a little boy who's faced with a bully and then is able to say a magic word and live without fear? Nothing scares Captain Marvel. Imagine a life without fear. Like, how much better is that than super strength? We, okay, we're going to get into that. Let's bookmark that because I've got a, I have a dissertation on that. <laughs> uh, the idea of fear and what immunity to fear can or should mean in different ways. Oh, God. This may be a two-parter. Okay, and what's the last? What's the last? Uh, the last uh, letter in the name? The last one is the speed of Mercury. So Captain Marvel, while not as fast as the Flash uh, per DC bylaws, he is very, very fast. Uh, he is as fast as all the other characters who aren't quite as fast as the Flash. Right. So Superman or Wonder Woman or yeah, he's right in that neighborhood. And uh, some people will also put the flight ability that he has there. Yeah, I was going to say, I was like, I, I've been thinking as we were talking about this, where does this flight come from? But now that I remember, Mercury actually could fly. So mm-hmm. that actually, that tracks. Yeah, so. and the super speed power is oftentimes used for like flash utility super speed, like in the Golden Age. It's it's not so much that he uses it tactically as it's like, you know, if you need someone to real quick clean up the pie eating contest that Dr. Savannah made a mess of, he can do that and like save the day for everyone. So everyone can have a nice <laughs> afternoon. Like that's kind of what he uses his super speed for. Right. It's funny because I keep flashing back to uh, the the Captain Marvel focused Justice League episode or Young Justice episode where they where um, Clarion splits the worlds. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's a there's a world for 18 year olds and under and a world for adults. And Captain Marvel finds that he can travel back and forth between them, which is was inspired by an actual comic that was based on the same idea. If I remember correctly it was actually the first young justice comic from back in the day that whole idea is genius and yet another way to focus on billy as a kid you know the the aspect of his power that he's a kid and an adult you know backwards and forwards but in that episode he has to drill through the ground and come up under the gem that's causing all the problems and he literally says out loud speed of mercury power of zeus Right. And then he like drills yeah. through the ground like we often see Superman do. Mm-hmm. And that's where I was. I was like, OK, speed of Mercury, I get. But why power of Zeus instead of strength of Hercules or strength of Atlas or, you know, why that particular choice was interesting to me for some reason? Well, this uh, OK, this is a pedantic point that someone brought up to me a long time ago over a heated game of hero clicks. So let me just put this out there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Wait. I love that I have a podcast where the phrase heated, heated game of hero clicks comes up <laughs> and in context, yeah. and I, I totally hear what you're saying. There's no other kind the way I play it. Um, 
So <laughs> what what he was saying is like, okay, so in the it, it pre-crisis Superman can can push the Earth out of orbit, right? Because of his right. tremendous strength. Right. Strength? What what muscle do you use for that? That's flying, surely. Right. It's the same way here. What muscle do you use to just put your arms out to your side and spin? Like with your feet on, like, that's not a muscle. That's your flying power. So if he gets his flying power from the power of Zeus, uh, then presumably he's using his flight ability to spin with force. And he's using his speed of Mercury to spin really fast. Interesting. Oh, oh man. You and I are going to have to talk about that off mic, too, because I have some opinions on that. <laughs> We're going to have, a, have to pull out, I'm going to have to blow off my hero clicks and we may need to go at it. <laughs> Okay, so now we've gone over like the power. Is there anything else that kind of unifies these powers at all, or is there anything like any other aspects of these powers you want to talk about in basics before we dive in? Well, I mean, we've established that he can fly, and then we also his transformation has some subsidiary effects. So, like when he says the word Shazam, lightning comes down and strikes him with a, a crack of thunder, and he transforms into Captain Marvel. This lightning usually disorients people. And so especially in the golden age, it helped him preserve his secret identity. People wouldn't realize what was going on. Basically, it's just like a flashbang goes off and now there's a superhero here. Right. The, so they didn't have to worry too much about like him transforming around other people. The other thing is that the mechanics of the lightning are very like wibbly wobbly to use the Doctor Who term. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Notably, there's a golden age issue, I believe, of Captain Marvel where... He is working with a monkey at the radio station. Of course he is. Yeah, that's and a, that tracks. Of course, they have props for the radio drama that they're putting our, on, this radio drama featuring a monkey. And one of the props is a turban with a jewel it's, on it. And it's, 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 when Billy is wearing the it's turban, radio it says, drama featuring a monkey. <laughs> when Billy says his magic word, the lightning deflects off of the jewel and the turban and turns the monkey into Captain Marvel. So what you have Wait, now is a chimp. actually Captain Marvel or a monkey version of Captain Marvel? A monkey in a Captain Marvel outfit with the powers of Captain Marvel. So now Ooh, they have to... Oh, that has some implications. Yes. So now they got to go catch this monkey who has, who's basically has all the powers of Captain Marvel and can't say Shazam. So... Oh, God, he can't say the word. Oh. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There are all kinds of different ways this gets used, like... um. There are three other dudes who happen to be named Billy Batson who become the Lieutenant Marvels. They are... What? Uh, when, when Captain Marvel... When Billy Batson cannot fulfill his duties as Captain Marvel, there are three other people named Billy Batson who can become the Lieutenant Marvels. Like, one of them is Fat Billy, and, like, one of them is Skinny Billy, and there's a third one I can't remember. Yeah, great. Those are classic Golden Age. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they, the beloved character, Fat Billy, it, they can all take <laughs> on, like, part of the powers of Captain Marvel, right? Just think of the community, the community episodes about Fat Neil. <laughs> That's all I keep thinking of. Uh, he famously used That's his powers terrible. to save uh, Captain Marvel Jr. at one time. Like yeah, That started out as a thing where you know Freddie Freeman was going to die and became a superhero instead. Somebody spent a fate point to great effect. And I want to bring in the last thing, which is that there's also the whole thing of like the Rock of Eternity, which we don't even need to get into, but it's a whole other aspect of the character that Right. Captain Marvel's mentor, Shazam, lives at the Rock of Eternity, where Captain Marvel can go to travel through time, travel through dimensions, and have access to the wisdom of his departed wizard mentor. So as if his powers weren't enough, there's this whole other thing to him as well. And the seven deadly sins are trapped at the Rock of Eternity as well? Is that correct? <sighs> it depends. Is that something I remember? It depends on the version, but it's an iconic part of the origin that when Billy first visits Shazam he passes the seven deadly enemies of man, who are all these statues representing basically the seven deadly sins with a minor modification. Okay, I see. I gotcha. Okay, and all right, so we've got the powers down. We've talked about a bunch of other stuff. We've nodded a couple times to some other characters. In Young Justice, the only other Marvel family member that we meet is Uncle Dudley. Mm -hmm. He doesn't really say much, except... Good to hear, champ. Go to bed. Or did you forget something? And that kind of thing. He only has a couple lines. Right. But there are other family members, quote unquote, of the Shazam family. And he can impart his powers to people. Is that correct? Or like, how does that work? I, can't, I don't know what the origins of the, the other rest of how the rest of them got their powers. It depends on the version of the character that you're looking at. And so there are some like in... um. In Jeff Smith's version, I believe, 
actually Mary Marvel is like his lost little sister who he gets reunited with, who remains a little girl when she transforms. Like she gets some of the lightning. And so she transforms, but she just stays herself because Captain Marvel is a separate dude in the Jeff Smith version. So Billy is someone who can swap out for adult Captain Marvel, whereas Mary is just a little girl who becomes a little girl in a Captain Marvel outfit. Yeah. Okay, got you. Captain Marvel Jr., as I mentioned, he was in a life-threatening situation. Captain Marvel needed to save him and did so by basically getting the wizard Shazam to help him by imparting some of his power into Freddy. And this is Freddy, what's his name again? Freddy Freeman. Freddy Freeman. Yes. And this gives him permanently his own superhero identity as Captain Marvel Jr., who does not say Shazam to transform, but who says Captain Marvel to transform because his powers are like secondhand. Right. I remember that. Wasn't there something about Freddy also being... I think back in the day, he was like a kid who had had polio or something like that. There's something about him having an injury or a disability. Uh, yes, he, he does have a um, uh, crutch that he uses. Yeah, it's a, it's a part of his character, definitely, that he is, uh, he is disabled, which is, which is cool. And it, it plays on the potential of the Captain Marvel powers, because once again, you've got somebody who... I think people often sell the Marvel characters short in feeling that like basically the human identity is just... A weakness or it's a chance for that kind of like you were saying like marvel comic style dramatic storytelling where it's like okay i gotta beat this supervillain real quick so i can get back to school and that's cool but i think it misses what's used in in the original captain marvel stories which is that billy really is a fully realized wish fulfillment character in his own right he is a kid who gets a job at a radio station and gets to travel around the world having fun having adventures you know live in this weird like parent free fun life where he has like a great kid job it's really weird that's fun in its own right and billy does stuff he's not just like sort of waiting to get into distress to summon captain marvel and it's great in captain marvel jr that you take that a step further to have someone who is disabled and it's not like that's just a weakness like that is who freddie is you know that's his life and he's not waiting to turn to captain marvel jr to be useful you know, oftentimes uh, it's always fun when you get the the old compilations of Captain Marvel stories that when Captain Marvel Jr. has his own solo story, often it's in like a different art style. It's like a little more realistic, uh, a little less cartoony. Ooh, interesting. And, and you get to see a little of Freddy's life, which, you know, they're not like the deepest stories, but it's it's cool that there's a disabled character in comics who's like his identity yeah. isn't that. It's just that's just who he is. He just happened. It's just a thing. Yeah. yeah. Wow. I'm learning. I thought I knew quite a bit, but I am learning a ton and I'm I'm loving this. But then there's also Uncle Dudley, who becomes hilariously <laughs> awesome. So my favorite version of Uncle Dudley, my Uncle Dudley, is the uncle who basically attaches himself to Billy Batson and becomes a, a dubious honorary member of the Marvel family because he doesn't actually have any powers, but he claims that the reason he can't do superpowered things is because his, quote, Shazam Bago is acting up. No, that's not a. Th- he doesn't actually literally say that, does he? Yes, does he it is. Really it is that? his Shazam Bago, and so he needs the other Marvels to like lift heavy things and things like that. And he just has a costume that he made, that, so he just manually dresses up. He doesn't transform with lightning or anything. Oh, that's interesting because there's a um, what is it? Crisis on Two Earths, the DC animated movie Crisis on Two Earths, which is excellent. You everybody should go watch that. It's fantastic. They get attacked by. The Marvel family. It was Black Adam, who is a classic Captain Marvel villain. Mm-hmm. I believe Mary Marvel, Captain Marvel Jr., and a horrifically awesomely powered Uncle Dudley. <laughs> and they go to town on Martian Manhunter and Superman and Wonder Woman, and it's crazy. So it's interesting because in my mind, my emotional memory of Uncle Dudley is that he did have powers, which is so funny to me. Like, Whatever he was saying about his powers back when I was a kid reading these clearly convinced me that he, <laughs> his Shazam Bago was yeah, a thing. Yeah, I mean, you know, he's got the costume. Why would you, why would you disbelieve him? But yeah, he gotcha. Yeah. De- depending on the version. I, I mean, there are so many versions of Captain Marvel. I, I know there are super powered Dudleys all over the place. Right. And then, of course, there's Hoppy the Marvel Bunny. He is an anthropomorphic rabbit who has the powers of Captain Marvel. And then there's Black Adam, the ancient Egyptian person chosen to be Shazam's uh, sort of proxy on Earth before Captain Marvel, who in many versions is so old that if he says his magic word, then he'll turn to dust because his mortal identity is long dead. 
it's notable that many of these characters get their powers from a different pantheon. They have the same basic superpowers, but the the letters stand for something different. And so like the classic Mary Marvel has female deities and heroes that she gets her powers from. And Black Adam in some versions has Egyptian deities. Interesting. But yeah, and then there's a whole, like, he has his own rogues gallery. We mentioned uh, Takitani. There's a Captain Marvel fan club that's sometimes part of his adventures. So like like a lot of heroes, he kind of has his own his own sphere of influence as well. And it's notable that in the Golden Age comics, because he was, like, far and away Fawcett's big deal, unlike DC heroes who kind of each had their own city, Captain Marvel, like, routinely, episode, issue to issue, each story would be in a different, like, city in the world he would go and like have a local adventure in whatever country or whatever city so he had like this whole globe spanning thing whereas once he became a part of dc comics you tended to see like oh there's Fawcett city and that's where everything is kind of weird and cartoony and that's where captain marvel lives right wow i love the idea of his kid form also being competent and mm-hmm. going and doing things together or doing doing things as well yeah Okay, so now we have a little oh, a giant overview of <laughs> his powers, his history, the Marvel family, who we haven't seen much of yet, but we may in season three um, of Young Justice. And of course, if they have a time jump, which they said they are, and my guess is three to five years again, that means Billy's going to be an adult. So, I mean, he's going to be at least at least 18, yeah, if not older, which again makes, uh, makes certain things interesting to me. Does the Shazam Captain Marvel form get older as well? My guess is no, which means that if Billy keeps the powers until he's, you know, 80, does he Shazam into a younger version of himself? Yeah, you know? it, it, this is interesting because there there are different takes on this and different ways to do really creative storytelling with it. Like in some versions, Captain Marvel does become the wizard, right? And he just lives at the Rock of Eternity and then... Potentially, mm. somebody like Captain Marvel Jr. takes over more of an, like, an active hero role. And the implication is that's the cycle, right? You become the hero, then you become the wizard, and then you choose a new champion. Because it, part of Captain Marvel's origin story is the death of Shazam. As soon as Shazam's imparted the powers to Billy, this giant square, like this giant cube of stone that's suspended by a thread falls on Shazam and crushes him to death. I don't even know what to say. I I'm, don't even know what to say about that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. What, one of my, probably my single favorite superhero origin. <laughs> so you can do that and you so what they could do you know they could have an episode where there's the rock of eternity or whatever and this is like captain marvel has become a wizard and is now so cool and like a cosmic being and then he sends captain marvel jr to go handle stuff or mary marvel right the other version like we see in um kingdom come there's a really interesting use uh spoilers for kingdom come oh my god yeah i want to talk about this because this is really interesting to me there is this weird, like, grinning, sinister presence of this big, beefy Captain Marvel throughout Kingdom Come. And he's basically like Lex Luthor's personal assistant, dressed in, like, this red blazer, you know? And the big reveal, ultimately, which Batman figures out and reveals in dramatic fashion, is that's not Captain Marvel, that's Billy. Throughout the story, what you're seeing is a Billy who things went bad on one of his adventures. He said his magic word and transformed back into Billy, and never became Captain Marvel again. He was messed with with these like mind worms by Dr. Savannah. But fundamentally, I think it's very nice, subtle storytelling that ties into the themes of Kingdom Come about like about heroism and how people depart from heroism and maybe find it again. One of Captain Marvel's powers is courage. And when he says his magic word and transforms back into Billy, he he doesn't have recourse to that. He doesn't have the supernatural power of courage. And so he's convinced not to take up those powers again. And so there's something really powerful about the idea that here is the man without fear, who in some ways is the man that this world needed in Kingdom Come. But the boy needs to have the courage to say the words, and he doesn't in this very dark time. Yeah. He would, ha- he would have the power to be the one who can, who can have hope in this world if he could just have the courage to say the word and get that power, but he can't do it. And when he finally does become Captain Marvel again, you know, he first fights with Superman because of all the weird things that have been done to his brain, but then ultimately he saves the day. And I think that that also is symbolic of like in a dark time, the fear of true heroism and how ultimately that is, that is what you need. I mean, the simplicity of like, we're here to save people that, I mean, (laughs) that that's the solution to like the Gordian knot of kingdom come. Yeah. If you haven't read kingdom come, 
it's a it's a cornerstone miniseries that should be read in my opinion a lot there's a lot of things that i recommend people to read on the show but there's a handful of ones that i think give you um that affected the culture and perspective of pretty much the the industry and kingdom come was was one of them and and the billy aspects of the story were so again changed how i view the potential of captain marvel stories mhm yeah yeah definitely and it, if I can just real quick about King, on this topic, it's a great example of using superpowers for storytelling because it is an equally valid version of storytelling where we have I th- what I think is really a Captain Marvel who's a different person in Kingdom Come, at least to a certain extent. And it, it acts as a metaphor, though, for being your better self in a certain way. I think anyone, when you go through times in your life that not only are dark for you personally, but are kind of dark for your world, there is that like that fear and that that feeling of hopelessness that you have to make the leap of faith from like i know i'm not the person who can like do something about this or handle this or be a hero here but that version of me does exist i have to make the leap of faith to the better version of me and i think that's that's a powerful kind of storytelling you can do with captain marvel because he is so powerful and yet a boy and then there's that there's that chasm there's that one magic word in between Mm mm-hmm god uh, my head, my head's in like six different places now. This is, uh, I, to be honest, like I thought we were going to talk about Captain Marvel and I was really excited about it. You're changing a lot of how I view Captain Marvel as a character and the potential for storytelling that you can use for him. So let, let's go back to the powers a little bit and reflect on those powers individually and their effects on storytelling and how they might uh, reflect other characters that you may be trying to tell in your own stories or, or how they're used in Young Justice. Mm-hmm. Like, the wisdom of Solomon to me, in the episode, they're, they're, sitting around the, they're sitting around, the Justice League is sitting around trying to vote on who's going to be admitted into the Justice League. Mm-hmm. And they come up, they stumble across this conversation about Billy. The fact that they now know that Billy is a 10-year-old and that he's a kid and that Batman knew the whole time, et cetera, et cetera. It's a, it's a brilliant scene. It's mentioned, you know, he does have the wisdom of Solomon, and then Aquaman says wisdom doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean maturity. And I agree with that statement. I mean, technically it's true. But when you used an example earlier of like, oh, Billy's being tricked by someone, and then Captain Marvel can tell that he's being tricked and, you know, helps him get out of it, seems more like life experience than it is about wisdom. Do you know what I mean? Like, what yeah. is what is wisdom? And, and having a couple of kids myself, the wisdom that comes out of their mouths sometimes is shocking and insightful. And to me, I like that version. That wisdom of Solomon needs to not be ignored. You know, that childlike wisdom. I'm not a theology scholar, so I don't know all of the interpretations of Solomon's adult wisdom. But I, I don't know. So maybe that, maybe that helps me in see this as Billy. The wisdom of Solomon is not something necessarily that Billy only gains when he's an adult. It's something that he owns and that he carries. And I like the idea that, that instead of having him becoming a different person, him becoming a different person means that Billy never learns anything from the stuff that happens while Captain Marvel is there, unless he's like Dr. Fate and, you know, he's in his head looking out and seeing what's happening and, and how they particularly play his memories of Captain Marvel's actions, I suppose. But it's still not him actively making choices, and that's the thing that I think that I want. It's like, it's like Captain Marvel becomes a supporting cast character in Billy's story, and that you're then having the supporting cast character solve the problem where the protagonist does not. And there's a part of me that has an issue with that if if that's an interpretation that isn't handled well. Well, I think that you have to be careful with the line between Billy and Captain Marvel because sometimes when they're very distinct, like in Jeff Smith's version, when they go to the Rock of Eternity, they can literally stand next to each other. Like they're that much two different individuals. Yeah. But even so... Captain Marvel is strongly coded as the grown-up Billy, like the better version of Billy that he aspires to be. So there is an interplay between those two characters, even if 
Billy is not literally making these decisions for Captain Marvel, which I think is arguable. I think you can you can argue that in some sense they share a consciousness because Billy definitely remembers everything that happens as Captain Marvel, and he remembers it in first person, but he's in a different headspace because he is his grown up self. So he makes a different decision than he maybe would have as Billy, but he remembers making it. But even if we have them as two different people, there is a sense in which we're telling a story about the same person diachronically in a weird way. And so if I think of like, you know, what if I could summon myself from 10 years from now to make good decisions in my life? I mean, that would be an amazing superpower. And the whole story would be about me, even though one of the versions of me is from a later time. You know, you as the consumer of media are still learning about me the whole story. Which leads to a whole down another rabbit hole. Because if the interpretation is that Captain Marvel is literally the adult lessened experience lessened as in ha having learned lessons i just made that word up apparently <laughs> an experienced version of billy then you start getting into time paradox questions i mean if he's literally coming from the future into the past type of a thing as opposed to is he a separate person that's separate from billy or a parallel universe maybe version of billy might be like the a different way to put it which means that they live two separate lives which means those things don't change yeah, I think he's he's definitely not from the future. I think the alternate reality is closer to what's sometimes been portrayed. Mm -hmm. You have to go into your fairy tale brain. It is a child's idea of all the powers I'll have when I grow up. I'll right. know what to do when I grow up because I'll be a grown up. That's what Captain Marvel is. He's me only as a grown up, so he's not scared and he knows what to do. Right. I hear that for sure. I think I'm thinking of it from the perspective of if I'm going to create some, create a character or create a story or an idea that is playing with some of these Captain Marvel tropes, what are the things that I have to think about and what story elements do I want to focus on and like turn up and which ones do I want to turn down mm -hmm. depending on the kind of story you want to tell. I think it's absolutely fascinating that in this Jeff Smith version, they stand next to each other, can literally have a conversation. That's fascinating. I also find it fascinating this uh, Miracle Man or uh, Sleepwalker version where they mm -hmm. don't community like they have to leave messages for one another meaning that they are two sep completely separate individuals that could be interesting the idea that billy rides inside captain marvel's head while he's doing stuff it's less interesting to me but okay but absolutely the most interesting thing to me is the idea of billy still being billy as an adult and i think that's because i've seen interesting stories with that from young justice mm -hmm. and justice league unlimited uh and this idea that captain marvel in that superman story i was talking about it's clearly billy having an emotional reaction mm -hmm. it's not an adult alternate universe shazam saying like oh billy's going to be upset or right you know that kind of thing and this all does i mean we're talking right now about about wisdom and that does the use of that power hinges on your answer to this question. And like, I'm no theologian either, but to go to Solomon, for a, for a character who is renowned for wisdom, Solomon makes an awful lot of bad decisions. Like, I think it is, I think it is canonical <laughs> in like the biblical sense that basically Solomon was spared for David's sake because Solomon made really bad choices. He reinstated the worship of idols in Israel. So he was granted wisdom, but that didn't necessarily mean that he made all the right choices. And sometimes... Interesting. Captain Marvel's power has been portrayed that way that like he has access to the right answer. That's basically what the wisdom means is that if he wants to bother to know what he should do, then he can find out. But he's still Billy. And sometimes Billy may be too impetuous or too emotionally motivated to listen hmm. to his own wisdom, which is, I think, a more it's a way to tell a story about a Captain Marvel who is truly Billy, yet also has wisdom is to say, basically, it's a door in his mind that he can open that he may sometimes just decide, you know what, screw it. I don't want to do the wise thing. I'm too mad. Interesting. I'm not sure how I feel about that interpretation. I like, I like the idea of focusing, it, I think, on the protagonist. I, I guess I, I like the idea that he doesn't have to go somewhere else for the wisdom. He's wise on his own. I like that. The, the thing you, uh, you know, referenced earlier about Billy being a competent character in and of himself, which we mm -hmm. see you know, in, in this episode where Billy is trying to get to you know, try to get to uh, the uh, up to the watchtower, but it's not going to the Zeta tubes aren't going to work for him. And then yeah. he has to get to Happy Harbor and the whole deal. Like Billy's competent mm -hmm. kids getting himself to across the country. Right. And I like that idea. 
and the wisdom aspect of it, I guess I just want kids to have more respect on that wisdom aspect. And as much as I love Aquaman, though his comment was technically true about the maturity versus wisdom, I was very dismissive of the... They've already worked with Captain Marvel for a long time at the at that point, and they have seen him be successful and do the things he's doing, but they immediately start talking down to him in that episode, which bothers me. You know, what this, and this I promise will be a very short tangent, what this reminds me of most is a discussion I once heard. I, I went for some time to a community college where there are different kind of like criteria for who gets into classes because there's public funding. And so it has to be open to people who can meet certain requirements. Yeah. So there were some overeager parents trying to get their very, very young children into community college courses. Like I'm talking like five or six years old. And, and there was an issue with it because it's like, we have to be able to legally show that they can't do that because if they're capable of it, we have to let them in because of the funding and like our mandate. Okay. And there was basically a question of like, okay, math is one thing, but can we have a six-year-old in a literature class for adults? Because no matter how smart this kid is, like, she's never been in love. I mean, she doesn't... There's no frame of reference for... Yeah. yeah. And so there is a question here of, like, when Billy turns into Captain Marvel, does he know what it's like to be in long-term love with someone? Does he know what it's like to experience tragedy in the way that an adult does? That's all a part of wisdom. It's hard to imagine it being imparted with magic. So if we're going to think of it in that level, Mm, it's like... Interesting. I mean... Maybe Aquaman is right in the sense that if there are certain things that you have to experience to know about them, and the magic does not cause Billy to have experienced them. Right, right. I think my concern is his choice of words. Like if he mm-hmm. had said wisdom does not does not mean experience, mm-hmm. I'm on board. But that's not what he said. He said wisdom does not mean maturity. And I can tell you right now, my four year old daughter is more mature than a significant portion of people that I have met in my life, I'm sorry (laughs) to say. She makes very good decisions. She thinks things through. She's very perceptive. And this idea of, that brings up, a a, a, again, maybe a philosophical or theologic question, part of the aspect of advisors to communities, so say things like um, uh, like a, a, a priest or something that has a tenant to somewhat separate themselves from their community that they are actually advising. Mm-hmm. So the, the idea of like, I guess, a Catholic priest who's not supposed to marry or, you know, shaman from various cultures actually living in the society but separate from the society mm-hmm. gives them the perspective, the wisdom, and the separation from the actual emotional drama of what's happening to be able to impart that wisdom and insight. And so to me, this idea of Billy... I think I think it's important what you're saying, for sure. I also think that it's important to not ignore the fact he hasn't experienced these things, maybe where some of this wisdom is coming from, because it's giving him an outside perspective on bad choices that, you know, say Hal Jordan is going to make because he's thinking with his um, libido instead of something else. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I love that. And I think that that would be a great way to do it, especially because... You were talking earlier about the scene between like Superman and Shazam, like why would you do this to a child? Shazam chooses Billy and it has to be Billy and he chooses him at the moment of his death. And the question of why that is, is something that's open about the character. You can decide based on your portrayal what you want it to be. Absolutely a part of it could be, this is a child who has experienced enough to have grown up, like he's had a hard life and he has shown courage and resilience, but he isn't innocent. And he hasn't gone through all the things that an adult has and and he hasn't become jaded. It may be that the wisdom of Solomon and the courage of Achilles have to start at that age. Like it it has to be Billy because if it were, let's say like, you know, Hal Jordan, as good a guy as he is in certain ways, right. He will never be able to access that wisdom because he's too much in it. I think you're, I think you're right. That's a, that's a great take on the character. Yeah. Well, then let's move on to some other things. I don't know if I have too much to add about the strength of Hercules, although, again, not being an expert on Hercules, I still think Hercules, think of Hercules as a really strong, potentially, like, superhuman strength person. I mean, he did, you know, the 12, it's 12, right? 12. He did the ordeals, yeah. Yeah, 12 ordeals of Hercules, yeah. He, yeah, Hercules is certainly super strong. And I think at least within like DC Comics continuity, it's very clear, like he is a demigod and, and Captain Marvel's strength is like top tier, but it's like, I think he's almost as strong as as Superman, but like, 
I think they've like they've arm wrestled and it was basically a stalemate, but Captain Marvel had to try harder. I think that's where they're at. They're like right there. Right. But that's not as important, I think, as what you can do with that strength. And it is like, I think the wandering monster slaying jovial Hercules is the archetype for what you use Captain Marvel's strength for in a story. Yeah. And, and that that plays a little into like wisdom and maturity and like being a part of things. It makes me think a little of um, how Connor's powers are used that like the fact that he can't fly is like so symbolically important with his connection to Superman. Right. You know, Connor is is in it and he he doesn't have <laughs> distance. You know, he he has to get in. Right. He doesn't have heat vision. He doesn't have flight. So Superman gets to be this iconic figure who is above it all and and not Connor. In the same way, when you give somebody all this strength, this tremendous amount of strength, it's part of the original iconic appeal of Superman. This is a place where I think the superhero genre owes everything to Superman because it is the fantasy of a child growing up, especially I think in an urban environment, to say everything here is bigger than me and I can't affect it. I just bounce right off it. But what if I could run faster than a train? Like, what if I could lift a skyscraper the way that I can lift my toys at home? Like, what if I could move this stuff? Like, I would be a real grown-up. I'd be striding across the world like a giant, you know? Right. That's Hercules. That's like the man who tosses lions around and redirects rivers yeah. and isn't dwarfed by the world. And that's that's Captain Marvel. I, I want to see that from, from Captain Marvel stories. Yeah, it seems like there are, though, of course, each of these aspects of him are tied to, theoretically, a specific power. I like this idea that it's more than just the strength of Hercules. It's... Hercules. It's the the platonic representation of Hercules, not just his strength, but that, like you said, like the jovialness in in the heat of battle or stress or combat that relieves the stress and strain of his colleagues. You know what I mean? Or yeah. that all of the other aspects, the presence, and I don't know, like when he's there and present, you feel better. And yeah, it's different exactly. to me than Superman. It's like the way the difference between how Dick Grayson leads versus how Bruce leads. Mm -hmm. right when superman shows up you feel better because superman can take care of business and you know that he's got the power to do it when shazam shows up you just feel better about life yeah. like you know what i mean like you're just like there's everything about this this person who just makes you feel like life could be more ideal and better if we were just better made better choices or different choices or chose to be better to one another you know that's part of the strength as well does that make sense i might be digging a little bit but i get you exactly it's it's a trope it's an archetype, and it is specifically a, a role, a literary role that we're familiar with that immediately casts him in that light for us. And that's what this elusiveness of the powers does, is it tells us this is going to be this kind of story. You've always heard these stories of, like, you know, the, this Hercules, this, this big, strong guy who's, like, untouchably strong and shows up and kind of makes light of problems in addition to solving them. Like, right. it's no problem when Hercules is here right? in a certain way. At least that's a, a strain of, you know, Hercules stories. Obviously, his ordeals are a little more serious for him. But for regular sure. people who cross his path, you know, right. everything's easy when Hercules shows up. And and yeah, you're right. Captain Marvel is the same. And it's different from other superheroes, for sure. It's like, like part of the strength of being able to solve the problem is believing that it can be solved. Mm -hmm. You know, that kind of thing. So moving on to Atlas, when we got to Atlas, the first kind of story idea that popped into my head was... This unlimited constitution he never gets tired thing is fascinating to me. Like, I can see, like, okay, so Superman, if Superman can out-arm wrestle Captain Marvel, right? Getting super mm -hmm. geeky here, guys. If he can out-arm wrestle Captain Marvel, really all Captain Marvel has to do is his best, the best he can possibly do, and do that forever. And then he's going to beat Superman. Like, if Superman can't quite get him all the way to the table, he's going to win. Shazam's mm -hmm. going to win, right? Or if, like, super, if, if there's a building that's going to crush a bunch of people, barring the weird physics of holding up a building that's not designed <laughs> to be held that way, but, yeah. like, if there's a you know, some crazy weight that's going to crush a bunch of people and you're going to choose one person to lift it and keep it lifted and one person to fight the bad guy, you'll probably choose... Like Captain Marvel, I can see him flying in and say, Superman, I got this. Yeah. You know, go do your thing because I will just hold it and never break a sweat and have a nice, calm and peaceful, presence-filled, uplifting conversation with the people who are hoping they don't get crushed by this thing I'm holding up. And, you know, increasing their morale, you know, while Superman goes off to do his thing. It's interesting how these different views or interpretations 
of powers can be made so much more interesting by stopping and thinking a little deeper about the various consequences of what they are and not just grabbing that first cliche, oh, they're they're basically the same, so we'll just have them fight because that's the only story I can think of. Yeah, especially when you've got an ensemble story or you're trying to do a different take on a character than is traditional. You're right, digging in and, and seeing like the little nuances, it means a lot. I, we see that all the time all over Young Justice. Like, I loved it's it's not precisely superpowers, but like it kind of is. Abracadabra versus Clarion, and how like this is <laughs> this is fake magic that's actually science, and this is real magic, and how that influences Wally, and how like his worldview will accept one and just not the other. Right. You know, uh, there's all kinds of times that we see the distinctions of different powers, or like the interactions among the different flashes toward the end of the second season, and like yep. where their different powers are at, uh, their power levels, and how they use them, and all those things. Right. You know, I, I really like Wally's portrayal particularly, and like that's a big character thing for him. Like, I mean, it is important for Wally that he's not quite there power wise. He's not quite on that level. Like that's huge. And I think, can we stick with Wally for a minute? Wally and that flash for a second, because I think that 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 Emily nod to Emily who brought this up to me, which I found really interesting. The episode where the team is, uh, Tim Drake's leading a team that's infiltrating the plant that's creating the reach drink. Mm hmm. Right. And they're about they're trying to escape. I think somebody turns to Impulse and says, can you pick can you pick them up and run with them? And Impulse is like, I'm fast, not strong. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because Emily pointed out to me, that's a thing Wally does all the time. Like he is constantly running with other people like, you know, Robin on his back and running at full speed, giving Robin the inertia to go do a bunch of stuff like we use it in our masks game as well. Like it's interesting the when you kind of dial it in and see what you can do that makes things different and the importance of what that difference is in these power sets. And then in addition to that, Impulse being basically more powerful than Wally can be frustrating for Wally fans, but I find it really interesting that at the end of season two, when Wally basically offers the Kid Flash mantle to Impulse because he wants to retire, Impulse is so excited about it. Like, he mm-hmm. is he's so jazzed about the honor to take Wally's place in this costume when Wally clearly does not have the power level of impulse. Do you know what I mean? It becomes yeah. more about their per- interpersonal interactions and who Wally is as a person that impulse wants to emulate, not necessarily the powers. Yeah. And that is the perspective of a person with the privilege of power, which is something that we sometimes see in superhero stories. Superman yeah. is a person who respects other people. And part of that is the privilege of not having to worry about other people hurting him very much. Like he's grown up with responsibility and not had to worry about really getting like, you know, picked on or abused or whatever. The question is, right. you know, what can I do? Because I, I can do so much and I have so much more than other people that leads you to respect the people who haven't been gifted in the same way you have. If you're a good and conscientious person, right. whereas if you're that underdog, sometimes it's a little bit harder to get over the power differential. Let's right. It's like, Class right. is more of a thing for people who are on the losing end of it. It's a little harder to escape. Right. And some of my favorite characters, uh, you know, to talk about, you know, my old my old favorites, the Golden Age Adam. I mean, basically his superpower is that he's like five foot nothing. And it's like... Oh, you're talking about the Justice Society Adam that's just basically a short boxer? He's a short boxer. That's his superpower. Yeah. And, right. and it's like, yeah, you know, what are you doing in the Justice Society? Why do you fight crime? Because I'm a five foot tall boxer. That's why. Because it's it's right. the world. It's the Second World War. Right. The world is going to hell. Like American cities are corrupt and full of crime. The world's probably going to end <laughs> because the Nazis are on the loose. Right. And you know what? Everybody needs to get in there. Like right. I, I'm I'm a person with every natural disadvantage. Basically, like I was born to fight, and I'm five foot nothing. So I have right. to fight people. I got to get out there and punch whoever I can reach. Right. What's, what's extra funny about that is he wasn't the only boxer on the team either. Right? Exactly. So there's, there was, there's Wildcat. There was Wildcat, who is the tall boxer, and Adam, <laughs> who is the short boxer. And I don't think there was any other difference between the two of them except their costumes. I could be wrong. I would be <laughs> interested to go back and read to see what's going on. But yeah, that's really funny. Yeah, and so, so sometimes it's it's the lack of powers, but but yeah, that different role that they play. And uh, to get back to Atlas, I think it goes to your role in the story because part of the thing about Superman, to me, it's important that Superman eventually gets tired, because part of 
the Superman mythos is Superman is only one man. And that's his mission. And that's part of telling interesting Superman stories is that Superman can't feed the world. He can't fix everything. So he has to use the immense power he has to get other people to do good while he has to sleep, right? Like he can't, he's only in one place at a time. Right, right. Captain Marvel's role in the story is he's the cavalry coming in. Basically, that's not part of the Captain Marvel story. He, he is not like, I think he comes to the rescue. He is like, he saves the day. He's your better self. And therefore he never gets tired. So it's like, he's finally ultimately reliable. Um, and can fight the good fight forever. His weakness is Billy, like in a certain sense, you know, he's, uh, but we're not really telling the story where Captain Marvel needs to get other people in on the act, which is such a big part of Superman. Well, this actually brought something up for me. Like I was just talking about the idea of how much I really appreciate and and like the version of, of Shazam where Billy is still Billy, like his mm-hmm. brain is the same, but he's in the adult body, which makes me think, here's the hole with that. The problem with that, why would he ever turn back? You can give some general reasons, but my quick, you know, spin around Billy's life tells me that he probably wouldn't necessarily want to turn back or need to turn back, where if he is a separate person or even an older version of himself and he's riding inside, then you get the Dr. Fate moral question of like, no, Billy wants to go back to his life and he's just taken it, taken Captain Marvel for a spin. Mm-hmm. But if he's turned into Captain Marvel, if he's if he's in, if he is himself with an adult body, but the rest of his mind is the same, he might miss a few of his friends. But I don't remember Billy having a lot of like he has no family and he's traveling around the world with, you know, this performing monkey or whatever he's doing <laughs> that issue. You know, if he's if it's actually him in there, why would he turn back? Like and that's a that's a plot point in uh, Miracle Man. Is it? Oh, because see, like this whole idea of endurance, I was thinking like, okay, yeah, Superman needs to sleep, so he's got to inspire. I get that. That sounds fantastic. But that also means Shazam never has to stop, right? Captain Marvel never has to stop. He can just keep going 24-7. If you're saying like he doesn't have to eat, sleep, you know, do any of this stuff, he could just go 24-7, which means why would Billy turn back if he could, maybe that is a, maybe that, is that kind of the story, the idea that he could go 24-7 and... It's, I believe, and I'm not very familiar with Miracle Man, but my understanding is it's the it's the Captain Marvel Junior slash Mary Marvel analog who ultimately decides not to not to turn back, and then you have the inverse in Kingdom Come where you know he grows up as Billy and decides not to be Captain Marvel. But there are a ton of ways you could go with this in a story, uh, certainly, and you could do sort of like there was that Superman twenty four seven storyline where like Superman just was Superman all the time. Captain Marvel could do that and make it work. The issue is again, it's about It's about story. In the Golden Age, Billy wouldn't do that because Billy had a job. Billy was a kid with a job, and that job was not just hanging out with performing monkeys, although that's a perk. He also was out doing, like, war reporting and things like that. So, like, Billy had a real life that was very fulfilling to him, and it was what he wanted to do. Right. And we're talking about at that time, and if in that time period he was not Billy inside, like, he was not Billy as an adult. He was was a ride-along. He's going to want to go back to that job. He wants to go back to that life that he had before because he doesn't just want to be a ride along. You know, like it's cool, but then I also want to have my own life. Again, we can think of the literal implications. We can also think of the of sort of the trope and we can think of the symbolism. If this is in some sense about your two selves, like your childhood self and your adult self and like that whole and your better self and your your maybe your weaker self in some regard. In any of those cases, the power comes with responsibility, right? If you could just be a grown up when you needed to reach stuff on a tall shelf or solve a difficult problem and right. then go back to being a kid in your leisure time, why wouldn't you do that? <laughs> why would you want to be a, why would you want to be a grown up and have job have a job all the time? Because Captain Marvel is a highly responsible individual. He is tasked like he is heir to the mantle of Hercules and Atlas. Like he has work to do. But not so much Billy. Mm. Billy's life is fun. Even though he has a job, it's a fun job. Which is interesting to me because I look at that as a very adult perspective. Mm -hmm. And by all means, challenge me on this. But I I see that as an adult perspective on Billy's situation and not a 10-year-old kid's perspective on Billy's situation. Like like As he turns into an adult and can run around and be a quote-unquote adult who never has to eat, never has to sleep, like never has to have like a job to pay bills... 
I think that he would do that. He might clearly do that for like a year before he realizes what's going on or that maybe there should be other changes that he does. Like he can skip all the parts that you don't like. I hated high school (laughs) with Mm -hmm. very few exceptions of things happening in high school and middle school was near nightmarish. You know, it, why wouldn't I skip all that? And just because as a kid, I'd be like, man, I wish I was a grown up. And as a grown up, you're like, man, I wish I was back at being a kid again with no responsibilities and fun. I guess I'd be interested to see if he does, if he do that or if there's a, a time in which he tried it and what the, what the reason was he chose not to continue doing it sounds like an interesting story arc to me. Yeah. And it, and it goes to the story of Atlas too, because you're right that he could do it because of his endless endurance. Yet, if we turn to the story of Atlas and Hercules, we see that at a certain point that becomes tiresome. And so it would be interesting, yeah, to do a story where Billy does just think, you know, the stuff going on for Billy right now is not great. Let me just be Captain Marvel and be a crime fighter and hang out with the Justice League all the time. And I think that may sound good to a 10-year-old or an 8-year-old, but after a certain amount of time of being expected to show up when there's trouble, of being expected to hold up your end of things like Mm. a grown-up, I think you would say, you know what, let me just go like back to my apartment where I have my room. (laughs) And that's like, my only job is to kind of keep it clean. And that's all people expect from me, really. That sounds great right about now. After, you know, my, my sixth hour of being on watch duty in the watchtower and all that, yeah, interesting. Okay, well, let's let's round out some of these other powers a bit. So the power of Zeus, to me, that was very, you know, nebulous, as you had mentioned. Mm-hmm. Um, but you opened up the door to some really interesting ideas. If you if you start to relate the power of Zeus, not just to, you know, the the kind of, again, first thing off the cliche shelf, which is, oh, he can throw lightning bolts or do lightning-y powers, right? Mm-hmm. But you open that up to, no, there's a mystical connection. The same way that we did with, like, say, the presence of and, and personality of Hercules is as much his strength as his physical strength. Mm-hmm. Then with Zeus, it's not just his, you know, throwing lightning, but also just this mastery of magic and or even yeah. the, shape sh- the shape-changing aspect of Billy turning into Captain Marvel and back, I also see as being, you know, an aspect of Zeus who is a consummate and um, annoying shape-changer. <laughs> you know, in his yeah. in his stories, there there have been some versions of the character where Captain Marvel can actually call the lightning to transform into like different outfits for like undersea <sighs> adventures and stuff, and that's power of Zeus uh, because of the shape changing connection. Whoa! If Captain Marvel grew up and started having like he could call the lightning and turn into other things like animals and stuff, oh my god! <laughs> it's yeah. almost like I've been list- I've been reading a seventy year old prequel to this character. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, as he gets, if we let him grow up and get older and experience what he can potentially experience, like, his his story and power set can become crazy. Like, yeah, fascinating. Yeah, this is, this is a hell of a hand that he's drawn on powers, and the power of Zeus is basically <laughs> a wild card. As a writer, you can do whatever you want with the power of Zeus. And sometimes, I think, if we're going to talk about iconography, it is just straight-up supremacy. Especially, like, his tagline is, like, the world's mightiest mortal. And that works right. better when he's in his own universe than when he's in the DC universe. Right. But in the Golden Age stories, really what I get from Power of Zeus is like Zeus is the king of the gods, the father of the gods. Like he's, he's the top. He's the sovereign. Captain Marvel is like just the best. He's just straight up the best. You try to do <laughs> things to other people. A lot of stories basically just come down to like, oh, I'm an evil hypnotist. I'm going to hypnotize everyone. And then they try to hypnotize Captain Marvel. But at the end of the day, it's like, sorry, buddy, I'm Captain Marvel. I have right. the power of Zeus. I'm the best. You know, he he always is just going to come out on top. And I think it's canonical currently that like only the very strongest magic, like I think it takes like the specter to do magical oh, stuff to Captain yeah, Marvel yeah. because he's just the power of Zeus just blocks it. That's literally the power of the Christian God, right? Because specter is a is an angel of God, like the direct, like a direct, a superhero yes. power <laughs> directly by God. Yeah. yeah. So so yeah. Unless unless God personally intervenes, basically uh, uh, using the Spectre as an appendage, then uh, Captain Marvel doesn't need to worry too much about uh, magical interference, which is nice. You know, Shazam is a big gun, and he gets his power from there. We don't see Spectre in uh, in Young Justice, but uh, if you want an idea, just a quick idea of, of a, a pretty cool, what I think pretty cool interpretation of the Spectre, go find the DC Showcase animated short. Ooh, yeah. That oh, that's it's good, but it's also scary. Like the Spectre is not an angel of hugging and happiness. Uh, the Spectre is the spirit of vengeance, and mm-hmm. how that gets interpreted. Also, 
go find the Batman Brave and the Bold episode. Oh, God, what was it called? Chill of the Night? I don't think I know this one. Oh, my gosh. Have you not seen that? Mm, I've uh, seen the showcase, but not the... Okay, so in my personal opinion, it is one of the best written Batman stories ever. And it was in Batman Brave and the Bold. And it's about the Spectre, who is the spirit of vengeance, basically talking to Batman about vengeance and his moral quandary about what he's doing and can he or should he let go of the death of his parents. You should definitely go look that. Just go find it and watch that one. It's good. But it's also a good, you know, look into the specter. Yeah. Which, again, when we're, when we're, when we're talking about um, the, the interesting idea where you have, like, a character like Superboy or, or Miss Martian in the same group as a character like Artemis or Robin, who have no powers, right? Mm-hmm. The, the, and we were just talking about two boxers in the Justice Society who were fighting alongside the Spectre. Yeah. <laughs> who we've just described. Dr. Fate and mm-hmm. the original Green Lantern, Alan Scott. And then you had a couple boxers and Black Canary, who didn't have a Canary cry back in the day. It was just like, I don't even know what she did, honestly. She was kind of a fighter. So they were yeah. basically like three gods or demigods and three like boxers. Yeah, and don't forget know. Johnny Thunder. Oh, yeah. Oh, Johnny Thunder. Uh, and, and, of course, Johnny Thunder, who was also basically uh, the ge- literal genie in a bottle with all kinds of magical powers. And then I also forgot, you also had Sandman, who was just like a dude with a gas mask and some sleeping powder. Yeah, very, very huge power disparity there, yes. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's hilarious, but also canonical and awesome. Or Dr. Midnight, whose power was, I can see at night, right? And or, not during the day. I mean, his, he and, had zero-sum right. powers, yeah. Yeah, right, exactly. He had zero-sum powers, right? And Hour Man, who was, had a drug who would give him uh, like Captain America-level powers, like physical prowess for an hour. Yes. And that was all. Basically, he took drugs. He just had a pill. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, anyway, it's a bit, of a bit of an aside, but it kind of is reflective of the age in which Captain Marvel was created. You know, like... Yes, and this would be a wonderful time to move on to the courage of Achilles. Because yes. we're talking about powers that affect tone now. And you can see there's... I, I really enjoyed how Young Justice was able to work in a lot of different tones into something that felt cohesive. And I think that part of that, the diversity of powers and power levels in the DC universe really helps you to do that because you can take the same setting and situations, but by slotting in different characters with different abilities, sometimes something can seem very light and other times it can seem very dire depending on what you're bringing to the situation. And Captain Marvel is a great way to address that because if you want to do a story where we don't need to worry about fear then use Captain Marvel because he isn't afraid. Or or I think you could make the interpretation that he's not distressed, or you could make the interpretation that he is never hindered by fear. There you go. Because the whole idea to me of courage or bravery is 100% dependent on feeling fear. Mm-hmm. Ignoring fear or being immune to fear as, you know, like the D&D paladin kind of a uh, power or ability, if it's stretched into more than just immune to supernatural fear, and it's kind of stretched into the day-to-day life of, I am not afraid of anything, that doesn't mean you have courage necessarily, because courage is required to have the fear and then choose to face it anyway. So to me, the courage of Achilles should be more reflective on the idea that he, or to me, it's more interesting, maybe I should say, that he feels the fear, he registers the fear, he has Billy's reaction to things with that fear, but he has that extra boost of like, I can do this. But I mean, if you're near and vulnerable and you're super speed fast and everything else, of course you're going to have more courage. So I, I would look at it that way and then as a writer, I would look at it that way and say, okay, so let's let's get a little more granular with this courage. And find out what it really means for it to be an aspect of his powers. Not just, yeah, yeah you're near and vulnerable, so of course you're going to not worry about walking into that building full of guys with guns, you know, or like, does it stretch out to other people? Does he have that wisdom of Solomon aspect of him that helps other people give them the confidence to face their fears? You know, those kinds of ideas might be more interesting to me as a storyteller. 
Yeah, it's difficult because on the one hand, it feels like this is taking something out of your palette as a storyteller if we're doing a story about Captain Marvel because fear is so fundamental right? that if we take it away, it feels like it's diminishing stakes in a certain way. And it depends on what kind of story you're trying to tell. Like not every story needs to be deep and psychological. And oftentimes the stories about Captain Marvel are just fun stories about things happening in the world, like a wacky set of circumstances. So sometimes taking fear out of the equation makes those stories easier to tell like uh, there's a classic Captain Marvel story, one actually where he he does briefly have a moment of like nervousness in retrospect at the end. It's actually kind of funny. An inventor invents something called atomic fire that burns atoms. And so there's no way to put it out. Literally any matter will just burn and tries to basically like sell it to the military. They don't buy it. And so he sh- tries to give them a demonstration, and accidentally sets the world on fire. <laughs> <Oops>. <laughs> and he can't put it out because he's got like he's got the what's supposed to be the cure for it, but it doesn't work. It doesn't put it out. So Captain Marvel, has, he goes, he solves the problem, right? Ultimately, I think he has to take like a big chunk of the earth out and just like huck it into space with the atomic fire on it. And then at the end, there's like a little bit where somebody's like, Captain Marvel, what's wrong? And he's like, oh, well, now that I solved the problem, I just had a minute to think about it. And I realized that the world almost ended. <laughs> That's a little scary. Mm hmm. If you're going to do a story with a threat quite that dire, but you don't want the story to be gloom and doom, then you can use Captain Marvel for it mm-hmm. because because he's not afraid. I think maybe more powerfully, you can use him in a story where it is about fear and he is one perspective to it. So for example, I love the way that Batman stories, they revolve around fear. Like to me, that is one of the fundamental differences between Batman and his Robins is that his world revolves around fear. Right. And theirs doesn't, in large part, because he's a good dad. You know, whatever else. Hopefully, depending on his interpretation. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's done better and worse things. But at the end of the day, there's something deep in your ra- in your upbringing that like how you, whether you have fear at the center of your world in that way. Right. And he does. And I feel like uh, particularly Dick does not and could have. And so if we have a character like that, who like fear is central to him, it's interesting to have a foil in Captain Marvel who he may be able to feel like, oh, this is this is bad news, you know, but he's never going to be impaired by fear. And he's never going to fear is not going to be a central motivation for him in the quite mm-hmm. the same way. I feel like um, I don't know if you've ever read the uh, I think it was Grant Morrison's Arkham Asylum Batman story. Maybe it's a while ago. Yeah, it's it's a cool story. It's kind of a one off. Batman gets basically blackmailed into going into Arkham when the inmates have taken over. Yeah. And it's this weird like psychodrama where Joker is basically like tearing the mask away figuratively and like prodding at Batman as most sensitive psychological points. Right. That's always on the edge of happening with Batman because of that central he became the fear in the night, right? It's that's his world. But for Captain Marvel, it's like no matter how bad things get, there is hope at the core. Or at least there is like Achilles. I mean, Achilles, you know, spoilers for the Iliad, guys. Achilles dies at the end. Right. I mean, not of the Iliad, actually, but uh, of the story. But he goes on. I mean, the the same theme holds true with Hector. There is this thing of like, you get in there, you do it, and that's heroism. And, And ultimately, the things you're afraid of don't have power over you if you if you go be a hero. And that's at the core of Captain Marvel to me. Yeah, it's interesting, the description of the idea where he's like, oh, the world almost ended, and now that I'm thinking about it, that could have gone terribly wrong, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, so I'm an IC, I was an ICU nurse, and a code nurse, meaning that I was trained to, when somebody had a code, uh, code blue somewhere on in the hospital, whether they had a heart attack or a respiratory problem or something like that, it, whether it was a, a patient or whether it was like a patient's family member, which periodically happened, I would be the code nurse for the day in the ICU, the code got called and I would get the gear and I would go down to what was happening along with like a team of people. We would show up from all over the hospital and then we would run this code and try and help this person. Mm-hmm. Being in that code wasn't an issue, right? Being in the situation where someone's life is literally in your hands and dependent on your skills and abilities and stuff, it, it can be nervous at first and then you become more skilled at it and more experienced at it and you do it. But every single time, an hour or two hours later, that's when the adrenaline dump stops, right? The adrenaline stops pumping and your brain is able to, it comes out of the zone and then you can start shaking, you know, or like (laughs) reflecting on what happened and what you did and what you didn't do and what you could have done or maybe didn't, you know, that kind of stuff. We had a medical emergency with my daughter when she was about three 
she had knocked herself unconscious and had stopped breathing. I just went into emergency mode to get it done, right? Like she, w- she ended up waking up and, you know, that kind of thing. And we had the EMTs here and they checked her out. She was perfectly fine. Intellectually, I knew she was fine. But about 45 minutes after the EMTs left, I was crying in the bed, mm-hmm. right? You know, where my, my wife, when it was happening, who is not a panicky person in any way, was understandably freaking out. Right. And in the moment. So it's interesting, that idea that the f- I'm not I wasn't afraid for my daughter in that moment, but I became retroactively scared of all of the potential things that could have happened. And then my brain goes down those roads. So how that fits into this interpretation of courage versus, you know, courage and fear and lack of fear or never feeling fear and how that can roll into a story of Captain Marvel or any or any character that you're writing where this is a thing, right? Or like I said, like a paladin story or somebody under a spell that makes you immune to fear, mm. you know? I don't know. That was sorry, it's, it's a bit of an aside, but like No, I I I I'm I think it's absolutely relevant and it's it's so human and that's why this is like I mean Kingdom Come does this to a certain extent. I mean we just talked about it. And right. when he's out there being Captain Marvel, he's fine. But when he stops and goes back to Billy and thinks about what could have yes. gone wrong. He doesn't want to say that magic word again, which I imagine is probably the same for people who have jobs where they're often in those situations. It's what a maybe great point. Oh, the moments I love that. In between, because the thing is, it's the message of hope of Captain Marvel, and, and it's what he has in common with Achilles, which we may initially think like, wait a minute, Achilles? Like, really? I mean, does he have a lot to do with Captain Marvel? But it is that, that heroism, and the message is, you can do it. You can be a hero. Go do it. To do that, you need courage. Because to go out there takes courage. To put right, yourself right. in that position Nick, takes courage. When the moment comes, you have the power to do it. You can act. But the fear will take you out if you don't have the courage. Right. And yeah, that's, that's superhero storytelling. And I think the fact that Captain Marvel's on the losing end of that in Kingdom Come is a great example of how to do a darker story using the character of Captain Marvel, which is rarely done but can be done very effectively. Yeah, interesting. To me, it's fascinating because we deal with that at the role playing game table a lot. Um, at least I have over the decades. I've been playing Dungeons and Dragons because of the whole paladin thing, where people think this immune to fear means that you're an idiot. Yeah, like I don't know better. I don't know I'm in danger. I'm immune to the dragon's fear, which means I'm going to do the worst thing possible. I, I, that doesn't even make any sense. Like you can be immune to the fear of walking across the street. That doesn't mean you're going to walk in front of a car, you know, like it's 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 led to some very painful like late in the middle of the night <laughs> debates on, you know, paladins being lawful, stupid, you know, and that kind of thing. So it ties into the kind of ethics and not to go on too much of a tangent here, but I think it does connect to Captain Marvel as well. And it connects to the ethical complexities of Young Justice. There is a basically deontological approach to ethics that some heroes have and it is that like, this is what we do. I am not a consequentialist. This is what we do. And the consequences be damned because right is right and good is good. And this is what we do. If you embrace those ethics, that is, that is an ethics of faith and an ethics of hope as, as vulnerable as it is to being subverted. That's the ethos of a paladin. It is, no, I will not poison the evil king and save the kingdom from his depredations. I know he's about to kill them all. I know the way to get him is poison, but that's not what we do. Mm -hmm. And that goes with fearlessness, because that is, I may not win, I may not kill the dragon, but this is what we do. So here I go. It doesn't mean that you're not smart. It doesn't mean that you're going to take a suboptimal approach or that you don't realize the dragon's breath is dangerous. But at the end of the day, you're going to do what is your job. Yeah, interesting. All right, well, let's move on to the last power here, which is this speed of mercury aspect. What I have to say only has a reflection of what we've already talked about with the idea that, okay, He's going to be slow and steady wins the race against mm. Flash, right? Right. But I've, we've never really seen Flash get... Well, that's not true. We it just Seeing Flash get tired is unusual. You know, it's an unusual story arc choice. Unless he's... There was um, uh, Doom. So Justice League Doom, which is an animated series that was... Ba- animated movie that was based on the comic. In Doom... Uh, the Justice League discovered that Batman had contingency plans in place in case any of the more powerful, which means pretty much everybody, members of the League, went rogue or had a problem or whatever. Batman knew exactly how to take down and or kill all of them. Mm. And that con- those contingency plans get into the hands of, if I remember correctly, Vandal Savage. And they start implementing them. 
Mm-hmm. And the one aspect of the Flash, what, what happened with the Flash, was the idea of basically the speed conundrum, right? So he's got a bomb attached to him, and if he s- slows beneath a particular speed, it will go off. And in that, part of the drama is, you know, when will he get tired? When will he get tired? How long will that take? That that becomes part of the drama, but that type of story is unusual for The Flash because he would, like, sprint around, you know, Las Vegas looking for all of Joker's bombs, you know, mm-hmm. and be back in, you know, uh, seconds, you know, in the Justice League animated series. I'm doing a lot of animated references because I'm assuming that people have seen those, or not assuming, but they're easier to get a hold of than some of the story, you know, maybe comics we're talking about in, in decades of history. What do you so how do you how do you look at this particular power? Is it anything that's unusual in any way than any other say speedster or character like Wonder Woman or Superman who has like you know quote unquote is a speedster? I'm reluctant to use that phrase because I don't see Superman as a speedster, but I think you, although he does use a lot of the speedster powers. It's interesting to make that distinction. I think that's exactly where it is. I don't think it is very different from what Superman has in this instance. I think it's just about the same. The, the interesting thing is why he has it and how that's different from a character like The Flash. Because, you know, characters like The Flash who are defined by that speed ability, a lot of their storytelling potential lies in the use of that power. We don't really see it deployed in the same way with a character like Superman commonly because Superman has other things going on. He's, he's conceptualized in a different way. So a lot of right. times when it seems like he would be using that speed to great effect, like you think of like, well, how would Flash deal with, you know, some, like if Flash had to fight the Hulk, how would he do it? But then when you think of right. Superman fighting the Hulk, it's like, well, he, I mean, he's not as fast as the Flash, but he's a damn sight faster than the Hulk. So, right. I mean, he, <laughs> but it's just not what you think of because it's not like at the top of his list of powers. Right. I think with Captain Marvel, it's the same story. I think he has the speed of Mercury because he is a, at his heart, a wish fulfillment character that, that is about, about a better self. And to fulfill that, and especially to like tie into the community the way he does, like he does a lot of stuff for people. He is like a public hero in his original inception. Yeah. He needs to be able to like take care of it all. And the speed powers are really useful for that. So, you know, he can go all around the city to do whatever. Right. It helps, again, it helps keep him from that situation where he needs to get a bunch of people to help him because he is, he's the cavalry, right? Like he's the one who gets called in. Right. Uh, that's right. how the story is constructed. I think I agree with you. I like the reflection you made earlier on when we first started talking about this, this idea that he used it more as a utilitarian ability. Mm -hmm. You know, this idea of, oh, I will be able to build this homeless shelter faster. Yeah, exactly. As as opposed to, you know, all the ways that Flash uses his powers. Yeah, and and he used it to travel as well. That was the other big one. I feel like, you know, Captain Marvel is super fast in the same way that like early Doctor Who, the Doctor can time travel. Like, he doesn't really use it to solve individual problems. He uses it to get from adventure to adventure, or if an adventure ends in a messy way, to fix it so he can just move on. Right. But he doesn't really use it in the middle very much. It's sort of that kind of thing, you know. That's an interesting observation about Doctor Who that I didn't. I don't think I quite codified in my head, but yeah, you're right. That's true. <laughs> yeah, I mean, think, think of how many decades it took for Doctor Who to actually start being about time travel on a week-to-week basis. It's kind of crazy. Right. Yeah, interesting. Uh, all right, fascinating. I, I just had one more thing just to throw out there for our listeners, which is the interesting fact that there are the the standard designations for the Young Justice team or the Justice League or the DC Universe in Young Justice. There are the there's the team, which are the B as in boy designations. There's the C designations, which were for the pets. So Sphere and Wolf are C zero one and C zero two. But there are the A designations. The A designations are actually authorized guests, and they start with, you know, like Snapper Carr, right, and Catherine Colbert, who's their, you know, their public liaison, right? And then you get Satana, and you get, you know, that kind of thing. But Billy Batson is added after that episode that we were just talking about, about the fact that he couldn't get anywhere mm. um, because he hadn't been scanned as Billy Batson. So Billy's A05, but what's fascinating to me is that Freddie Freeman is A06 and Mary Brumfeld is A07 and they are both have designations before Mal. Huh. So Mal is actually A10 and there is no listed, according to the YJ Wiki, 
there's no reference for any listings for A08 or A09. So mm. we don't know who they may potentially be. Dudley and Hoppy, obviously. Oh, yeah, um, clearly. Yeah, yeah. Being Hoppy an anthropomorphic, sure. an anthropomorphic <laughs> bunny. I mean, I, I see where that's a gray area, but I feel like that's an A. If you can, if you can come in like a, like a nice suit and vest, you're an A. <laughs> then we're going to start getting Captain Carrot and the Zoo Crew crossovers and a whole bunch of other stuff, which I think <laughs> well, might end up being more like episode six, yeah, like season six, I'm thinking. Oh, yes. I'm, I'm coming back for that episode. I assume that's already scheduled. I, it's on my calendar. <laughs> so I don't know if I told you about it, but... <laughs> Oh, okay, good. I'm glad you let me know. We'll definitely have you back for the Captain. I have not had anyone else say, I want to talk about how I want to see Captain Carrot in Young Justice. <laughs> but uh, all right, man. Well, that episode went from like, I don't know, how much are we going to discuss about Shazam? Let's give it a try and see what happens to a deep philosophical conversation about pretty much everything <laughs> and how <laughs> powers, powers relate to the stories that are being told, what not to focus on, what to focus on. And uh, the importance of looking deeper in each of these analyses. Um, thank you so much for coming back, Chris. This was fascinating for me. I, I hope you enjoyed yourself and I yeah. hope our listeners enjoyed, our, enjoyed themselves as well. Thank you so much. Yeah. So where can people find you uh, here on Earth Prime? Well, you can go to the Tumblr for the Gameable podcast. It's at gameabledisneypodcast.tumblr.com. Gameable is spelled G-A-M-E-A-B-L-E. And that's where you can find links to all of our old episodes all the way back to Snow White. That's the main place. But if you want to follow us on Twitter, you can also go to at Gameable Podcast to catch all the new episodes that come out. If you want to check out Mega Dumbcast, that is on Podbean as Mega Dumbcast. It's on iTunes. It's on Google Play. It's everywhere. So you can look up Mega Dumbcast, all one word. And I think that's pretty much it. Yeah, Gameable Podcast, Gameable Saturday Morning Podcast are all searchable on your podcatcher of choice. Yeah. And uh, the most recent episode I had listened to was the Scooby-Doo episode, which mm -hmm. had just released, I think, just before we recorded last week, right? And the part two aired today, I think. Is that right? Or yesterday? The game that we played, I played a game with Lorelai from Good Looks, Bad Books, where we pitched smut story pitches, <laughs> right. uh, where we paired characters with the characters from the Scooby gang. So if you're interested yes. in teenage superheroics, you will have nothing to do thematically with this episode of Gameable Saturday Morning that has just come out. The first half, though, before you got into the um, the romance stuff, which I haven't actually heard that second part yet, was amazing. So go listen to that, guys. The Scooby-Doo episode analyzing the history of the show and, and how it came about and like the inspirations behind it and how it changed basically a whole genre and influenced how things like the you know Godzilla cartoon was made. Um, that we spoke about in the last episode with Chris. It's fascinating, and uh, particularly how they reflect it into, how you reflect it into how you would do particular things at a table, but also writing as well, like emphasizing what characters over other characters and, and that kind of thing. So definitely go check that out. And of course, the whole backlog of Gameable Podcasts, is, the Gameable Podcast is amazing. So thank you. And you're, you're welcome. Thank you, man. Thanks to everyone uh, for sharing some time with us as well. You can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files. On Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at theyjfiles.tumblr.com, and on our website, crashingthemode.com, as well as our email address, whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. If you enjoy our show, please consider sharing it with a friend. You can also support the show by giving us a review on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings help other people find the show. If you do leave us a rating, please let us know, especially if you're outside the, the U.S. We have to look a little harder to find those. And even though Season 3 has been officially announced, please continue to spread the word to friends and family about the series. Hashtag buy YJ Comics on Comixology. Pick up the comics, get yourself up to speed for the Season 3 premiere. And as always, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours, under Creative Commons. 
Thanks for listening and stay whelmed.